Hello, my name is Stephen Parisian and this is the British Car as Social Icon. This brief survey looks at when and why the British motor car became a true social and design icon. It certainly wasn't in the early years of motoring. Before the First World War in Britain as elsewhere, the motor car was largely seen as a rich man's toy, pernicious, precarious and dangerous. Indeed, as a symbol of wealth, sophistication and conspicuous consumption, in its earliest years the motor car was seen by many as a weapon in the class war. Rural communities often threw glass or tacks over country roads to stop passing traffic and in some instances even barbed wire was strung from tree to tree across the road. Reflecting the general fear of the wealthy motorist, in 1908 the novelist Kenneth Graham made his Wind in the Willows character Mr Toad into a wealthy, irresponsible motorist, the terror of the highway and a true social icon of the age. After 1918, however, the car became a crucial element in breaking down class and gender barriers and ultimately became an iconic agent of social change. The first and possibly most important of these agents was the Austin 7 of 1922. It was originally aimed at a similar market to Henry Ford's remarkably successful Model T of 1908, which was actually made in Britain. And here is that Ford factory at Trafford Park in Manchester, Britain's first motoring assembly line. Um, began, the factory began in 1911. The Austin 7 was launched as the motor for the million, as Austin claimed, so cheap to run it makes walking foolish. And unlike the more masculine Model T, the 7 was promoted and acted as a classless and gender-free automobile, just like its descendant 40 years later. And here is that descendant. Um, half of the mini production when it was first brought out in 1959 was originally badged as an Austin 7. Also, unlike the Model T, the Austin 7 was bought by everyone, from aristocrats to shop workers. Working families bought it as essential transport, while wealthy households, who already owned a large car, bought it as a fashionable runabout. In 1924, Cambridge University's Vice-Chancellor, Sir Albert Seward, bought a 7 as his second car. Um, thus, at least in the view of the carmaker Herbert Austin, giving the model a prestigious social cachet overnight. The Austin 7 also appealed to women. In 1930, the British motoring magazine Car Illustrated pointed out that cars such as the 7, promoted as, quote, the first small car to give the woman driver everything she wants, now enabled women to travel independently. As the magazine noted, women drivers could now, quote, shop 20 miles away, lunch 40 miles away, and still have time to return home to prepare dinner. A well-upholstered saloon version, the Austin Ruby, in fact became the first car in the world aimed specifically at a female audience. Such was the success of the Ruby that it was quickly imitated by the Roots Brothers Empire, with their slightly larger Hillman Minx of 1932. By the mid-1920s, what gave the motor car its social cachet was not just design or affordability, but also accessibility and the ease of operation. In this, it was helped hugely by the electronic starter, introduced by Cadillac in 1912 and common in Europe by the early 1920s. This meant that women no longer had to grapple with a stiff, heavy hand crank to start the car's engine. The car now offered practicality, flexibility, classlessness and cross-gender appeal and became the passport to individual expression, more than a luxury or even than essential transport. It was now an incarnation of freedom, equality and escape and a liberation from social, class, gender and geographical barriers of the pre-war era. The 
car also expanded holiday horizons in the 1930s. Indeed, after 1945, the provisions of the 1938 Holiday Pay Act, which was designed to enable more working class families to have some paid time off, were finally able to be implemented and enjoyed with the car after years of war. By 1959, indeed, more British holidaymakers were travelling by car rather than by train to their holiday destinations. From the 1930s, iconic British car designs were being devised to fit the everyday urban, rural and even colonial markets, with no one worrying about emissions, carbon footprints, or except perhaps in the aftermath of the Suez crisis in 1956, the ready supply of cheap oil. The Morris Minor was one of the few new cars available in Europe in the years after the war's end. It was a classic design, which was an instant hit. However, its maker, William Morris, detested it. He said it looked like a poached egg, and he ensured that its original name, the Mosquito, named after the outstanding World War II fighter bomber, was dropped in favour of a disinterred and rather lame pre-war designation, the Minor. But the Minor was accessible, cheap, and perhaps most importantly, immensely characterful. In the right hands, it could have been a global rather than just a national hit, Britain's VW Beetle, perhaps. Introduced in the same year as the Minor, the Land Rover of 1948 was an instant icon too, even the Queen bought one in 1954, and there she is on the right. By the early 1950s, there was a, an increasing emphasis on personal cars, cars that were more about image than substance, following the lead of the groundbreaking Ford Thunderbird of 1953, seen here uh, in an everyday scene with which I'm sure you can uh, all identify. Many iconic British designs followed this lead, although inevitably they were far smaller and far cheaper. Here's two of them. On the left, the stylish little Triumph TR2 of 1953, made at Canley in Coventry and styled by Triumph's very own Walter Belgrove, who's been called the first real British car designer. And on the right, the similarly styled, cheeky little Austin Healey Sprite of 1958, whose engine actually came from a Morris Minor. It was made at the MG Works in Abingdon and designed by Jerry Coker, who intended it to be, quote, a low-cost sports car that a chap could keep in his bike shed. Although I think you'll need quite uh, an extensive bike shed for that. And incidentally, I don't think the blonde who's perched on the boot is, uh, is being very wise. I don't think that car would take any sort of weight at all. Equally iconic was the superb um, 1959 Triumph Herald splendidly styled by Giovanni Michelotti for Standard Triumph uh, and Standard indeed bin their old name to brand all future products as Triumphs. It was a timeless design that was, was radical, sharp, very Italian, although originally the car was just equipped with a, a, a rather poor 948cc engine from earlier Standard cars. Later it was uprated. On the left here we see one of those uprated versions, the Triumph 1200, in American guise. And on the right, one of the Herald's first celebrity customers um, being viewed with jealousy by his bandmates on the far side. By the end of the 1950s, British cars were being devised to fit the consumer rather than the other way around, and were intended to say something about you. Even the modest Ford Anglia of 1959 was promoted in this way, although I think this rather um, clumsy montage showing and the Anglia sort of squatting on the slopes of Gestad um, really was a, a bit of a bridge too far. Rather more convincing were, were these two. Here we have on the left the MG Midget of 1961. On the right, it's um, slightly larger and more longer lasting cousin, the MGB of 1962. Cars were by now being used as benchmarks of social or indeed, as you see on the left, sexual aspiration. And indeed, the car said more about you than your home or even your job. It had become a crucial item of clothing, an essential accessory, not a disposable piece of equipment. Perhaps the most stylish accessory 
at least for those who could afford it, was the wonderful Jaguar E-Type of 1961, seen here sleek and gleaming on the cover of its launch brochure. In Enzo Ferrari's words, the most beautiful car ever made, it was a two-seater touring car that looked like a racing car, but wasn't. Indeed, it rarely reached its advertised top speed of 150 miles an hour. Like the Ford Thunderbird before it and the Ford Mustang after it, the E-Type was devised as a personal style accessory and not as a performance car. And here is the Mustang of 1965, surely influenced by the E-Type. Both have those, those long bonnets which actually um, don't con conceal much in the way of an engine, but look as if there's, there's some huge power plant underneath. The car could now suggest, if not always deliver, success, wealth and raciness. And actually one car that did manage to deliver all three was the superlative Jaguar Mark II of 1959, an instant success as a executive express. 1955's Jaguar uh, 2.4 had been comprehensively updated and given a, a more powerful 3.8 litre engine, more chrome, tighter curves and bigger windows. Nothing in Europe or America could rival it. Henry Moore, the sculptor, called his much-loved Mark II sculpture in motion. And as you see at the bottom, that the car dominated saloon car racing for the next few years, enhancing its racy image even further. For those who couldn't afford a Jag, there was the Rover 2000, or seen here in later guise as the Rover 3500, one of the most remarkable cars, I think, of the 20th century. It had been crisply styled by David Batch to recall the famous Citroen DS, the DS19 of 1955. And here is the DS, just to jog your memories, what a lovely car. How on earth did it get on that rooftop, though? The new Rover was indeed stylish, advanced and comfortable, and as this American ad says, it was very much wanted. You can see it as the uh, automotive epitome of, of Harold Wilson's white heat of technology, and it became an icon for everyone from film stars to corporate executives to the police. Here is one of those film stars, Princess Grace of Monaco, and the Rover in which she sadly met her end in 1982. Thanks to models such as the Jaguar Mark II and the Rover 2000 3500, by the mid-1960s cars had replaced railway engines as the iconic stars of literature and film. Even children's heroes were cars, not trains. Here's of course Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Ian Fleming's magical car of 1964, made into a film uh, four years later. And let's not forget Val Biro's lovely gumdrop introduced in 1966. And that surely most famous of, of movie cars of the 1960s, Herbie. OK, yes, it was an American film and it was a German car. You can, you, we all know its origins. There's Hitler uh, admiring a new um, strength through joy car in 1938. Um, but uh, no, I have to say, I have to admit, in Britain, the love bug of which this was the star was in Britain the highest grossing movie of 1969? Think of all the lovely things that came out in that year. No, The Love Bug was the most popular. It's a car that perhaps is today better remembered than its driver, the film's notional human star. Anyone remember who that was? Um, it was a, a, a staple Disney actor. Um, his name was Dean Jones. Cars were by the mid 60s film and TV stars in their own right. Here, of course, and you knew I was going to show this, here, of course, is the uh, James Bond with his Aston Martin DB5, a model of 1963, here posed for a publicity shot for the film Goldfinger of 65. But don't forget a later James Bond seen in an earlier incarnation. Here indeed is Roger Moore, um, star starring in the TV series The Saint uh, of 1962 to 9, as Simon Templer. Here he is astride his Volvo P1800. And yes, this, this Volvo was British. The P1800 was originally made for a couple of years by Jensen in uh, West Bromwich. Famously, of course, the series producer of, of The Saint wanted Simon Templer 
following the books to drive a Jaguar. But Jaguar cars, oh dear, told him, oh, no cars are currently available. A familiar story, as we'll hear again in a minute. Don't forget, too, the many motor cars featured in the increasingly surreal TV series The Avengers of 1961 to 9. Not so much, perhaps, those driven by John Steed himself. Steed was given a variety of cars before the producers settled on a stable of Bentleys for only by Series 4. Um, here's one of them, uh, this lovely uh, 1926 three-litre Bentley in British Racing Green. Ironically, Patrick McNee, who played Steed, actually hated driving. And often the cars were sim simply steered by him onto the set. Although here you can see the exhaust is actually going. He's not looking hugely as if he's enjoying himself, though, is he? Perhaps more iconic was uh, Emma Peel's powder blue Lotus Elan S3 of 1966. Um, a, a neat and, and, and nicely styled little car. And this exposure on TV did wonders um, for its image. Um, in, in truth, it was a rather fragile little motor. Don't forget too, Tara King's later maroon AC48. And there she is, I stride it. British cars even found themselves centre stage in the Nouvelle Vague of French cinema. Here is a Triumph Spitfire of 1962. That's one of the stars of Jean-Luc Godard's rather scary so-called comedy Weekend of 1967. Most enduringly, the endearing Mini Cooper was cast as the star of the 1967 film The Italian Job. Although, as Michael Caine recalls, and don't worry, I'm not going to do the accent. We went to the British Motor Corporation, as it was then, and asked if they could donate some minis in return for the publicity the mini would receive. They were fantastically snooty about it and said they could only manage a token few. Fiat, on the other hand, completely got the idea and offered as many cars as we wanted, including sports cars for the Mafia scene. As a result, the Mini's great European rival, the splendid Fiat 500, was, with a handful of fiat owned Lancers, prominently showcased in the traffic chaos of Turin, which was the film's centrepiece. Close to home, the gritty Policier Z cars, first shown in 1962, made an unlikely star of the Ford Zephyr. Although, in fact, this was rather a coincidence, the Z of the show's title had nothing to do with the Ford Zephyr at all. The scriptwriters envisaged it as denoting the forces Z division. Um, still, the Zephyr benefited hugely from the resulting publicity, although its appearances were largely limited to the titles um, during the actual um, the series itself. Producers prefer to use the cheaper to run Ford Anglias and Ford Cortinas, and I think that's a Cortina. We can just glimpse on the left there. The 1960s also pioneered gender free and classless cars in the tradition of the Austin 7. Cars which look good, which reflected the owner's awareness of trends and fashion, but which also suggested economic sense and prudence. The wonderful Mini of 1959 was one such car, in fact, the ultimate cult car, aimed at as much at women as at men and, and completely classless. Here's two early ads from, from the Mini's early years um, at the top. Well, a scene we're not like to see much of today. But at the bottom, what on earth are they doing with that fishing net? And why is the driver pointing? Um, answers on a postcard, please. We'll, we'll be running a, a caption competition for this. Here is the Mini's wonderful designer, um, Alec Isigonis, um, with uh, after over 2.7 million Minis have been sold. And here is a selection of celebrities um, and their Minis. There at the top is Enzo Ferrari, prizing himself out of his. Uh, bottom right is uh, film star and car fanatic Peter Sellers, um, with his then wife, um, um, Britt Eklund, understandably nervous as she watches his car drive out of, of what is that, meant to be a cake or something? And uh, bottom left, you have that everyday couple, the Armstrong Joneses, squeezed into their Mini, with the, uh, the future Viscount Linley, looking um, um, somewhat precariously balanced on his mother's lap. I think health and safety perhaps should be told about that. 
in a way, the, the, the 60s was all about the Mini, and the Mini was about the 60s. If I was asked to select an image that best defined that, that swinging decade, well, perhaps um, one of the two following images would suit very well. For here is Twiggy and her Mini in perhaps the, two of the most classic iconic images of the decade, images that say as much about the Mini as the model. Don't forget, though, that as well as the celebrity endorsements, the Mini also benefited hugely from its sporting associations. In 1961, Alec Isagonis collaborated with John Cooper to produce a gutsy, racing-friendly Mini Cooper, a lovely brand which British Leyland were some years later to senselessly throw away, but which was, of course, resurrected by BMW early in the 21st century. In many ways, though, our story ends here, as the confidence in iconic British motors came crashing down in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Perhaps as a, a quick coda, let's just remember a few of the events of that period. The creation of the overlarge conglomerate British Leyland in 1968, uh, which saw um, fabulous British marks now competing with each other, indeed stopping production and stopping research in exciting new models. There was, of course, also Rolls-Royce's shocking bankruptcy in 1971. And in 1972, the unexpected and equally shocking collapse of Aston Martin, and they collapsed again in 1974. In 72, this was one of the, the uh, Mark's leading products, the Aston Martin DBS. Um, shortly, in my view, anyway, the, the worst ever Aston Martin, bending over backwards to appeal to uh, American design tastes. I think it, it looks awful, but some of you may have other ideas. And of course, and you won't forget the oil crisis of 1973. Note the car at the top, by the way, we'll be coming back to that in a minute. Um, the ensuing three day week, the government's Chrysler bailout of 1974, and of course the collapse of British Leyland itself in 1975. I think British cars became increasingly associated with the failure of management and of striking workforces. Car factories were very visible. Um, uh, it was one of Britain's biggest industries. Indeed, in 1970, British car production reached its peak. In some senses, the car industry became symptomatic of and perhaps was blamed for the failure of Britain in the 1970s, with the car as the most visible symbol of British decline. There was a failure of design, too, as the timeless icons of the 60s gave way to, well, the characterless, style I don't think so this is of course is the Morris Marina of 1971 as one unkind critic put it put together from the spare parts bin at the Cowley factory it was a really little more than a, a redesigned Morris Minor here we have it um, you know, rather um, daringly placed in that real design icon Bruno's wonderful train shed at Paddington station but in fact despite the racy so-called lines of the Coupe shown here. It was a very, very ordinary little car. I know my mum had one. There was the dull, and so many to choose from, but here per perched rather uh, um, awkwardly, perhaps on the on the bank of the River Thames. Here's the Horizon of 1978, originally a French Simca. It was then made in Britain and, and rebadged as a Chrysler, then as a Talbot, as we see here. But it looked no less boxy in, in either guise. And the weird, um, and of course here is the notorious Austin Allegra of 1973, British Leyland's Song for Europe, as they claimed at the time in the year, of course, in which we joined the common market. Uh, on top right there you see the dark sass design of the Countryman three door. Um, not perhaps quite as ugly as the um, va posh Van den Plas version, bottom left, which one critic compared its nose to that of a pig's snout. And bottom right, of course, is the notorious Quartic steering wheel, or square steering wheel, as it was soon dubbed. It only lasted a couple of years before it was replaced by a more standard version. And then, of course, there was just the depressingly mediocre um, years of impressive, wonderful triumphs, saloon sports cars, ended with this, the last triumph of all, 
uh, the dismal triumph for claim, nothing more than a, a, a rebadged Honda. Indeed, the disillusionment of the 1970s was reflected, I think, in the changing roles of cars in film and TV. In the wonderful Get Carter of 1971, here we see Michael Caine dumping Geraldine Moffat's love little sunbeam alpine in the River Tyne with poor old Geraldine still in the boot. But of course, in the Sweeney broadcast from 1975, we could perhaps see Regan's Ford Consul GT interpreted as a metaphor for the corruption and violence and decay of British society in the mid 70s. Now, there's a there's a doctoral subject for you. Um, with that, um, we, we take our leave of, of British design icons. As you know, the real automotive social icons of the 1980s were really German, uh, uh, principally, in my view, the Golf GTI top left. And of course, the BMW E30, I think the, the most handsome, the best designed of all BMWs. Although, as many have pointed out, you know, who knows what horizons were lost to British motoring manufacturers in that decade. The Triumph Dolomite, top left, the, the Triumph Stag, top right, were beautifully styled by Giovanni Michelotti, even though the Stag itself was hugely unreliable, it looked gorgeous. So Triumph itself could have evolved these into something like you know, the, the remarkably similar looking BMW E30 below, which was styled by Ecoli Spada, but he acknowledged a huge debt to Michelotti. By the next decade, though, even James Bond was driving German. Here is Pierce Brosnan looking uh, somewhat unhappy in his BMW Z3. And of course, it took German vision and, and yes, German acquisitiveness, but also a big dollop of British design genius to resurrect three of the greatest British automotive icons early in the 21st century. And of course, I'm referring to the Mini of 2000, um, although that was, was designed by a Brit, BMW's Frank Stevenson, and Bentley and Rolls-Royce. There is a top right, a Bentley Continental of 2014 and a Rolls-Royce Dawn Drophead of 2015. All these marks, of course, now owned by the Germans. Thankfully, though, we still have our memories of what was once wholly our own. Thank you very much.